If you have your Bibles for our scripture reading this morning, you turn to Romans chapter uh, 8. Carol obviously has got on a theme here in our music of love, the love of God. Amen? And uh, she never knows it, never knows this, but uh, I actually have some scriptures on love in my sermon. But I want to read uh, Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 35 of our scripture message this morning. Paul writes, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for the love of Christ. We thank you for your love that sent him to that cross. We thank you for his willingness to come and be beaten and smitten and nailed to that cross and has his blood shed for our sins. Father, we thank you for the gift that we have in Jesus Christ and salvation through faith by your grace. We thank you, the Holy Spirit, that is the one that saves us and seals us to the day, of, teaches us the word of God and grooms us to give you glory and praise for who you are and what you've done for us. Father, we come together today as the body of Jesus Christ here at Cornerstone to give you praise and glory for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. Father, we stand before you this morning crying out that we would be acceptable to you. We pray that we would be walk worthy to the vocation as we are studying in Ephesians, that we walk worthy of the vocation to which you've called us here at Cornerstone. We know you've got great plans for this church. You've called us here and fitly framed us together to do your work as the body of Christ. And Father, I pray that you would motivate us and excite us about the ministry that we have ahead. Father, we would roll up our sleeves and go to work and seek your face in everything that we do and, and say and just stand back and watch you do a work among us. I thank you for this testimony of Arlene and the fact that we've been able to help this family in need and they're giving testimony to others in our community about Jesus Christ and the love that's shown abroad here. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you get the glory. It's not because of us, it's because of you and the Holy Spirit that works in us. And we're obedient to do your work. And people out there see the love of Christ shed abroad in our hearts. And Father, in a dried community today of lack of spirituality, Father, the love of Christ stands out. And people want it, and they don't understand it. And we need to be faithful to not only show it, but then teach and preach it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And we're to be faithful with the Word of God today. And each day as we work in the workplace, and we shop at Publix, and we do the things that we do, we need to be faithful with the Word of God and love to share the love of Christ and the gospel message to those in need. I thank you for what you're doing here, Lord, and I just pray you continue to guide and direct us each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Carol? Worship. It's time now to honor him by studying his word. And uh, we're in the middle of a series for our visitors this morning. Uh, the flock has learned when I start a series. I have no idea where it's going. I have no idea how long it's going to last. And my approach to it, when God's done with me, then I'm done with you. So, 
We're talking about the Church of Jesus Christ. Welcome, Cornerstone. Um, for our visitors, this is Cornerstone Fellowship, the body of Christ that God's calling together here in Loxahatchee to, to do His work. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is the first church that really had an impact out here. Um, how long were you all in the uh, storefront? 14 years, 13 years, something like that? I think, I think from what I remember, because uh, I was pastoring down on military at the time, I think, I think that started about, uh, about 14 years they were in the storefront. And then it took you two years to build this building, roughly. And then we've been here about 10 years since, right? I know I've been here right at 10 years. Huh? 98? 98? So. This church has a long history out here. And I thank God I've been a part of it for the last 10 and having a blast. And uh, watching it grow and watching God bring new people in and change lives and get to baptize a bunch of you. and and watch God grow your lives in Christ has been fun. And I coined the term shortly after I came out here about God fitly framing us together. It comes from Ephesians chapter uh, 2. God is patient for Himself here at Cornerstone. That's, that's a term that you need to wrap your head around. Okay? We're a holy habitation of God as the body of Christ. We've been talking about the dynamic of the body. Give me the next slide. I've been asking every week, why are you here today? And you're probably going to get tired of me asking you this question. But by the time we get done with this study, I want you to have a why you come to this church, or why God's brought you here. Because it's not a simple question. It's certainly not a yes or no question. And I know some of you kids might be here because your mom and daddy drug you here and you became kicking and screaming. I know some kids come to church that way. Certainly not our kids, right? None of our youth? Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, but that's a legitimate question. And as I pointed out last week, and I, as I mentioned in Sunday school, I was tempted to put it back in my sermon today, but I went on with it. But I'm going to just briefly mention a couple of them. Why not to come to a church? And I'm going to tell you, because you like the pastor is not a reason to come to the church. I know I'm a nice guy. And a great preacher. No, but the reality is, yeah, amen. Thank you, Bill. Of course, he needs glasses, but that's neither here nor there. But the reality is, God may call you to a church where the pastor is a great Bible teacher because you need to learn more about the Bible. And that's legitimate. But God almost also may call you at a church that the pastor is relatively young and new and not real deep in the Word, and maybe you need to be his mentor. And sit in the pew, and he may not be teaching you a whole lot because he's not there yet. He's not deep enough yet to really teach you where you are. But God may have called you there to help him. I was called to a church one time because the pastor was 26 years old, sweet young guy, I really loved him to death, and, and, but he had no experience in ministration. He had his wife handling the books, which you don't do as a pastor ever. You don't have your wife counting the money and handling the money in a church as a pastor. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's an instant uh, recipe for, for crucifixion <laughs> or stoning or something. Certainly tempting. And God called me there to help mentor him. I've been saved for years. I've been involved in church leadership and management and so forth. And I knew that immediately I said, Scott, you can't do that. You need to pick somebody else in this church to handle the finances. He had no idea how to organize a Sunday school. He had no idea about really running a church. He was just a great little preacher in Bible college to be a preacher. 
And he could get up and preach a good message. But beyond that, he had no skills. And I know God called me there to, to, to mentor him. And then two years later, that's the church I was ordained in. So, you know, God calls us to a ministry. As I mentioned last week, he, we all have a call on our lives. Give me the next slide. You know, turn to, turn to Ephesians chapter 1, where we're sort of camping out here for the next couple of weeks. And verse 18 is the key. This is why I'm here today. One of the major reasons. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know. And I recommend you underline that word know. If I ask you today, how much do you know about the Bible? Hopefully a lot. Do you know enough? Do you know too much? Never. But the reality is, we come together as the body of Christ at Cornerstone to know God and have our eyes enlightened. I hope that's a major reason you come to this church. I praise God there's a Bible preaching church. I praise God we've got some great Sunday school teachers. I think Carol's been doing it for ever since I got before I got here. And she's a great teacher. I hear so much good from the ladies that go to her ladies' Bible study, as much as I hate to lose them in my Sunday school class. I know Carol's ministering to them back in the back, and I have total confidence in her teaching abilities. Thank you for Holly and, and, and Angel have taken over our, our young adults on Sunday mornings, and I've got total confidence in those that young couple to, to guide our young adults. That's a young couple that's, that's God's using in a special way, and I thank them for that. Thank you for their volunteering to, to take on that ministry. And it's a tough ministry. I've taught young adults for a lot of years. That is a tough group. If any of your young adults are here, you're a tough group. <laughs> okay. A lot of stuff going on when you're a young single and, and uh, just trying to find out what life's about. And maybe you just, you're either a senior in high school, college, and, and somewhere between mom and dad funding you and trying to go get your apartment, get on your own, and not having enough money to make it happen, and, and all the other stuff going on, and the hormones, and boyfriend, girlfriend stuff, and all this stuff going on. It's tough. It's tough being a young adult, especially today. It was tough enough when I was there last week or two few years ago, right after Bill. But the reality is that God brings us together as the body of Christ to know about Him. Our eyes being enlightened. That word enlightened there means it, it comes from the, the Greek word phos, which is phosphorus, light. The light goes on, you know, a light bulb turns on. That's the idea here. It's the idea of learning the Word of God, learning to apply the Word of God, going out and experiencing the Word of God, uh, in, in some cases getting your brains kicked in and going back to the Word of God, you know. And uh, it, we, we mentioned in Sunday school the word maturity. Maturity has really little or nothing to do with your age. I've seen people in their 70s have no clue about the Word of God. And I've seen others at 14 or 15, just it's amazing how much they know about the Word of God and how they live it. And so maturity doesn't necessarily have anything to do with age. But we're to be enlightened by the Word of God. And the, the, the statement here that we picked up on is the next statement in this, in this particular verse. The eyes of our understanding being lightened that we may know what is the hope of his calling? And that's where we started last week into this idea about the church of Jesus Christ. What is it? Why are we here? We are here because God has a call on a life of this church. If you're a visitor today, and I've said this the last couple of weeks, you're not here by mistake. Or you're not here by happenstance. And I don't know if God's going to call you as a visitor to become involved in this ministry or not. That's up to Him. I tell people all the time when they ask me about my church and whatever, and I tell them, I said, I would love for you to come and be involved in our church, but I would rather have you where God wants you. I don't want people here that God hasn't called here. 
they tend to be a problem at times. Maybe God calls them here to cause problems. I don't know. I'm not sure that's how it works. I think that's more Satan bringing them in. But, you know, people hear that God's called here to be involved in this ministry, and then I know He'll use us all, and we can maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and grow this church and reach out to this community and do the work that God's called us for. And so when somebody comes to me and says, God's calling me somewhere else, first of all, I hope it's true, because a lot of times it's just an excuse to leave the church and go somewhere else. And I know that. But the reality is, if God's calling you somewhere else, be sure and go, and we're going to endorse it. I will say one thing. If God is calling you from one church to the other, that church can rejoice in your absence. If you leave and that church is not rejoicing in your absence, Usually something's wrong. Did you hear me? If you leave a church and go to another church in that church, maybe they're happy you're gone. That doesn't necessarily mean you were called to, to go, okay? Maybe you were causing problems, but that's a whole other topic, okay? But the reality is, and, and, and I'm just, I don't like to use myself a lot as examples, but it works. When I came here from Grace Fellowship, Pastor David gave me an honorarium to come here, and that's why we got a basketball hoop out here. Because I spent it on a basketball hoop for our youth. But I told David that God was calling me out here. He was excited about it. He supported it. And not only did he, did he is, I know he's still praying for me. I had lunch with him a couple weeks ago. But he wanted to know how our church was going, all about it. Now, in fact, he wants to come and speak first of next year, hopefully. But, you know, when God calls you from one church to another, it's a good thing. If it's God's call. If it's not, it's a bad thing. It's wrong for the church. It's wrong for the church you're going to. And it's wrong for you. And that's how we need to look at church attendance and church membership and church involvement. It's a call on our lives. See? Now, it talks about the hope of his calling. Give me the next slide. What, is, what does that really mean here? Well, we mentioned a little bit about this last week. You know, from 1 John, where John talked about handling Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Imagine John was the one in the upper room the night that Christ was going to be betrayed, and he's lounging on the pillow, and he's sort of leaning back against Jesus' chest as they're eating. And then Jesus starts passing the bread and passing the cup, and John is right there. I have to believe, quite frankly, because I know John was at the cross. Seemed to be the only man, the disciple, that was at the cross, unfortunately. All the rest of the flakes had run off on him. But I have to believe that when, when, the, when the Roman centurions were leading, leading, leading that, leaving that body down off the cross, that, that John and his, and his mom were probably the first ones, to, along with Nicodemus and and Joseph of Arimathea, John was probably the first one to grab a hold of him and lower that dead body to the ground. Because I know John loved Jesus. And the first chance he got, he handled the body of Jesus Christ. And then I can only imagine in the upper room when Jesus resurrected from the dead and showed up in the other room, John probably grabbed a hold of him and didn't want to let go. Because John loved Jesus Christ. See? And then when you read this, it makes a little more sense. About him handling the eternal life. And the reality of what we're really here all about, and this is the bottom line, is eternal life. Do you understand eternal life today? What that really means to you? You're invincible? Not physically. <laughs> but eternally, you're invincible. Yeah, you know, I tell people all the time, till God's done with me, I'm invincible. When He's done with me here on this earth, there's nothing I'm going to do to stop it. You can, you can do health food, and you can do the gym, and you can do everything and still drop dead <laughs> when it's your time. Or get run over by a car or something. Now it's guaranteed tomorrow. See? 
The issue is we serving Him today. Are we being worthy of the vocation to which He's called us to? Today. That's the key. And when we're gathered together like this, are we doing it as the church? Being worthy of the vocation that He's called this body. You know, one of the things that's missing in our Western culture today is the body dynamic of the church. We got a lot of people stay home on Sundays because they don't they don't like to organize church anymore, and they think they can just stay home and watch TV or read their Bible or go out and sit under a tree and hum or whatever else they do, and they're being spiritual. And that's not biblical. God works through His body. We are the body of Christ. We are the presence of Jesus Christ today in this room. If there's anybody who's walked in here unsaved, guess what? They'll sense Jesus Christ in this room. Because if you and I, each of us that are saved, have brought a little bit of Jesus with us today. And hopefully his love will be shed abroad because we're here. And we love him. And they'll see our love for him. And he loves us and he's working through us. Okay? And that's what this is talking about. Is that eternal life is manifested. I hope you're excited about your eternal life today. I keep stepping on this thing. My problem for trying to walk or liking to walk around when I preach. Um, could be a drum I'm tripping over, so it could be worse, right? Ah, but, you know, God has called this church together to do a specific work here in this area. You know, you look around and you see the diversity that we have, and you know, we got young folks, and we got old folks, and we got skinny folks, and we got me, and we've got others. And are you done? He always laughs at my jokes. I, I, <laughs> you let her cry, I think. I think. Bill back there crying now because he's he and I is we got that same we got that same profile you know ah better keep my I, I boy I almost hung myself there watch myself yeah is it time to move on thank you thank you Scott Scott's back to want me to move on give me that slide Scott yeah there you go the hope is the idea here and this is this is looking at, at the Greek okay. Uh, the word hope here is an You know when your dad says, uh, go to your room? Huh? You know? Come and yeah. This hope is it, the the hope of his calling is the idea that something you can't get anywhere else, nothing will will suffice when you understand the calling of God on your life. I, I I recommended a young man. I read it. My I was encouraged to read it myself. Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote, writes the lectures to his students, and in that particular writing, as he's teaching his young seminary men, he tells us that if you know, if you feel that God is calling you to be a pastor, you will not be satisfied doing anything else in your life. And he says, if you can be satisfied doing anything else in your life, you are not being called to the pastorate. And I learned when God called me at 40 years old to take over the pastorate and start pastoring churches, how true that was. Because I'd been a businessman for over 20 years, and all of a sudden business went, who wants it anymore? See? Of course, I'm still bivocational. I'm, not, I'm having to do some business to help pay my bills. But the bottom line is, this is my love. This is my passion. 
this is what now God hasn't called a lot of you to be a pastor, but God still has a call on your life to serve him right where he's got you. And your call is just as dynamic and just as significant as mine. It's no different. We're all called to the royal priesthood, and you're a royal priest or priestess wherever. And that's the concept we have to understand as the body of Christ. That's who we are as believers. He has a call on our lives. Now, the calling is an invitation. It's a calling to be different than everybody else. Every call is unique. He doesn't call two people to the same call. He can't because we're all different. Different backgrounds, different personalities, different levels of knowledge or whatever. So every call is unique. And I can't define your call any more than your wife or husband can define your call. You're the one that has to understand your call. You do that through studying the Word of God and seeking God on, on, on what He's got you doing. Who's He got? I, I, I spent 10 years working with a young man, mentoring him, trying to make him understand that a call to ministry, he was primarily a youth pastor, I kept telling him, Jeff, youth ministry is not a call to organization. It's not a call to a program. I kept asking him, Jeff, how many, how many people do you have in your life right now that God has you working with one-on-one? -on -one? Because that's your call. It took him 10 years to get, that, to get that idea. Very analytical, great guy, smart boy, but he got caught up in the kids' town mentality, and he's trying to create all these programs and get volunteers, and it's driving him nuts. They, couldn't, they didn't have the funds. The church wasn't quite big enough to really take on a ministry like that, and he was trying to make it happen, and he couldn't get enough volunteers that had any knowledge or, 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 or experience dealing with young people. And, and it just, he was, for 10 years, he's fighting it, trying to create this program to, to reach all these kids for Christ and all this stuff. And you know what? Watch my wife with these kids. You know how simple junior church can be? And you know how often that it breaks my wife's heart? Kids want to come every week and the parents won't come and bring them? Because the kids love what she does back there and she's been doing it for almost 45 years that I know about. I can't tell you how many young kids she's led to Christ and, 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 and I've gotten to baptize and I mean four or five year olds getting saved in, in, in her ministry back there. And there's nothing fancy about it. She's got some curriculum, things they draw. She's, you know, doing little crafts and teaches them Jesus. And the main thing is love's on them. And that's all you need for youth ministry. It doesn't have to be fancy. We got this all wrong. The issue is, is there, are you called to that ministry? If somebody's called to that ministry, God's going to bless it. You get that? He's going to bless it. Um, what are you anticipating? Give me, give me the next slide. If I was a rich man, rich pastor, I saw a deal the other day, top, top 10 richest pastors. Made me puke. I'm serious, it made me puke. Pastors worth 20, 30, 50 million dollars. What's that about? With one exception, and I'm going to qualify. Okay, and I'm, I, I think I owe him this qualification. Billy Graham was on that, on that list. And they were saying worth 25 million dollars. But I want to clarify something. I know for a fact Billy Graham hadn't made 25 million dollars at the expense of the church. Billy Graham's family inherited a, had a mountain in, outside of Asheville, North Carolina, that he and Ruth lived on their entire life. Billy was raised there. 
And without even knowing anything, I could probably get a hold of their financial statement real quick. And that mount's probably worth 25 million bucks real easy in today's economy. And that's why you got to watch the press and what they say. Billy Graham and Ruth have lived humbly. He's ministered all over this world. He's to kings and princes. And I think he pastored seven or eight presidents and led more people to Christ than probably all of most other evangelists put together. And, and so I, I've been under his ministry. Uh, he's been a, he doesn't know it, but a mentor of mine for a long time. I used to have over 140 Billy Graham sermons I used to listen to on cassette tape, if you know what those are. How many know what cassette tapes are? Okay, good. Okay. How many still have some? Many still have some? Yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> okay. See, Doug? We're not in youth ministry, Doug. Doug and I were back in, Carol were back in youth ministry about two years ago, and I, I mentioned the record sticking. And the teens are all sitting there like, Doug Pokes, he says, they don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> so at least you all know what a cassette tape is, right? But if I was a rich man today, and I had advertised this week, Palm Beach County wide, on television, radio, that everybody that stepped foot in this church today is going to get $50,000 if they sit through the sermon and the worship, when the service is over, on the way out the door, I'm going to hand you 50 grand cash. Wow. Let me ask you some, let me ask you some, with that thought in your mind about even some of your quick comments, what would be everybody's anticipation level as they entered the sanctuary? Huh? Hope he's not long-winded, right? That'd probably be the first thing today. Huh? Dessert first, yeah. What would be everyone's anticipation level as the worship service began? Suppose they'd be focused on Christ? Huh? Hope she's not long-winded. <laughs> Hope it ain't one of them 45-minute song festivals. Right? Well, whatever one's anticipation level be as I began to preach. Cut it short, idiot. Nothing I've got to say is worth 50 grand this morning, right? Right? Huh? Are they here to hear me preach? Probably not. What about when we started a second song service? What would their thoughts be? Here comes that silly worship leader again. Now I'm, now I'm supposed to clap my hands and sing some more. Amen. You want to preach the rest of the sermon? You're right on. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, this, this makes you think. An exercise like this. Uh, you know, you'd have to start with this morning, uh, how many county sheriffs would we need out here directing traffic? And like, like Gary said, we're going to have to open up the doors and the windows and turn up the sound so the people out sitting out of the parking lot that can't get in can at least hear something, right? They can at least know when the service is over and come get to 50 grand. Huh? Exactly. 
They'd worse than the blue light special, right? What would everybody think when I entered my second sermon? I mean, I'm I'm giving out fifty grand ahead. No. I just said they had to stay to the end. Okay. Yeah. Now this long-winded blowhard is going to start another sermon. I can I, I can just hear him thinking. <laughs> if I preach long enough, they'll all leave and I can keep my money, right? <laughs> they don't know my heart. See, they don't know my heart. <laughs> I'm going to punish them if they're, they're going to earn that 50 grand. Folks, what's the cope of the invitation that God's given us to come this morning? The call is an invitation to come. And he's got a reason that he wants you here. And I hate to tell you it's not 50 grand. Because I don't have it. And if I had it, I'm not sure you're worth it. No. Because I know if I told you that, you wouldn't listen to a word I said. So. <laughs> but when, when it talks about the anticipation, what is the hope of our calling? That's significant when we walk through these doors. Every time we walk through them. Every time this body gets together, what is the hope of why we're here? God has given us an opportunity to come together as the body of Christ at Cornerstone. And he's got a purpose for everything that's going to go on, whether we're here an hour or two hours or five hours, it doesn't matter. He's got a purpose for everything that's going to go on. Every time we walk together, come together as the body of Christ. And we need to ask ourselves, why am I here? Why am I coming? What has God got for me today? What can I do for Him to give Him praise and glory today? And that's the key to a successful church. That's the key to a church that we, we sung about the love of God and the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts, the Bible talks about. We're to love one another. One of my sermons before I get done with this is going to be on the one another's. Get out your strong concordance and look up one another and see how many times it's in the Bible and go look up all the scriptures that it sends you to about what we're supposed to do with one another. It's a bunch. Okay? And that's what ministry is about. Give me the next slide and we'll get out of here. As we said last week, God has a call or purpose on every life. Ephesians 4, 1 through 4 talks about the vocation to which we're called. Verse 4 says that we're called in one hope. We thank you that we can walk worthy to the vocation through the power of your Holy Spirit that empowers us to do your work. Father, continue to work in this body. Continue to use us in your, in your ministry. Continue to help us see people saved and lives changed because of our faithfulness to the call that you've called us to. And God, whatever we do here, whatever we say, we want you to get the glory. And we want it to be in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Again, I thank the visitors for coming this morning. You may be here and don't know Christ this morning. Uh, if you've never really given your life to Christ, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You need to understand you're a sinner and God sent his son to die on that cross so you can have eternal life. And if you uh, would like to know more about it, I'll be down front. I'd love to talk to you. Maybe you're looking for a church to come worship in and, hey, we got one. We, we know where there's a good one, right? Amen? Amen. And uh, we love to have you be involved. Like I said before, I only want you here if God calls you here.